Right, hi guys, and welcome back to the Moody Yorkshireman, and it's that time of year again. The Formula One season has ended now. The final round was last weekend in Abu Dhabi, or the weekend before, whenever this video goes out. And uh, yes, it's time to see how right I was in the Constructors' predictions of 2023. So I put a video out there at the start of the season saying where I think the teams are going to finish in the Constructors' Championship. I did this based on what I saw during the few days of testing we saw at Bahrain before the start of the season, and that was it. I, I didn't have any races to go on, I didn't, I didn't have any knowledge prior to that. It was just literally what I thought I saw based on how they were in testing. So, let's see how right and how wrong I was. I think last year I did this, I got four teams in the correct positions, two of which were just a position away, and then two were completely wrong and in miles apart from where I expected. So, let's see if I can better that this year, shall we? Uh, but yeah, without further ado, let's get on with it. So, in first place, I had Red Bull. Now, I was expecting a strong season by Red Bull this season, but was I expecting one that strong? I don't think anyone was, to be fair. Winning all bar one race, and Max Verstappen winning all bar three of those races as well. His teammate, of course, Checo. Sergio Perez picking up the other two in the start of the season. Uh, but yeah, overall, it has been a year of dominance for Red Bull, particularly with Max Verstappen. Sergio Perez has had his struggles this time around this season, but Max Verstappen on his own would have won the Constructors' Championship and the Drivers' World Championship as he did. So Sergio Perez's struggles didn't hinder Red Bull in any way. In fact, it may have just helped him and assisted him because they have to pay a ridiculous fee per point that they score to pay for the entry into next season's championship. So the fact that Sergio Perez <laughs> scored less points means they're actually more beneficial going into next season and have a bit more money to play with. Thankfully, though, this uh, these points that they have to pay for don't affect the budget cap because if there were, I think it's something like $7.8 million they're having to pay to enter next year because of the amount of points they score. Scored. It's fucking wrong, isn't it? I mean, what a load of shit. You should be charging the teams at the back. You know, like, fucking. If there were one team I would really want to see off the grid right now, it would be Alfa Romeo. You know, I would charge them to I Evan and go, look, improve your driver's standards and just improve your quality of your racing. And you're going to have to pay us this much if you want to race again. But as it is, they penalise the, the big teams, they penalise the. Uh, the teams that are getting a lot of prize money and then they just get, get it all back with the points. So, yeah, you know, total dominance by Red Bull this season. I was correct to put them in first position. Did I expect them to be that dominant? No, I didn't. I did expect Ferrari and maybe Mercedes to get an odd win in there. But as it was, Carlos Sainz at Singapore just broke the winning duct of Red Bull. Uh, and even then, the Red Bull was quick in, in the end of the race, even though it was a circuit they were struggling at. I think both drivers just got frustrated in qualifying and didn't get the best qualifying position they could have done, uh, both out in Q2. I think the cars were capable of Q3, even though it was a bit of a dog to drive. And then in the main race itself, they ended the self by starting on the hard tyre compound there, and when the safety car came out, it ruined their chance of when they needed to pit, when they couldn't pit, etc. And uh, yeah, Max Verstappen had some mighty pace at the end of that race, but uh, wasn't enough to get a podium or a win. But yeah, there you go. Apart from that little slip-up from Red Bull this year, it has been one of utter dominance for him. And I was very much correct to put them in first place. In second place, I put Ferrari. Okay, so I was one away here. I was wrong by one. It was Mercedes that ended up wrapping the uh, second place in the Constructors up in the final race, I'd like to add. So yeah, Mercedes wrapping up the title in Abu Dhabi at the final round meant that I got this wrong with my prediction of Ferrari finishing second. Overall, though, Ferrari had the better season. They were just more unlucky, and they did Ferrari themselves at times, didn't they? The drivers were incredibly unlucky. Some uh, mistakes and accidents and incidents there, it must be said. Uh, Leclerc at the start of the season was very inconsistent, but found his feet. You know, had it not been for Carlos Sainz having that 10-place grid drop at uh, Vegas as a result of the manhole cover, that are lined up 1-2 on the grid... And I think that would have then seen a Ferrari victory because I think Max Verstappen's race start would have been totally different, him starting third instead of second. And uh, I think that could have maybe played into Ferrari's hands. And if they'd have got a win there in Vegas or a double podium even, they would have finished ahead of Mercedes as well. So I think unfortunate there that that was, that was a costly error that was no one's fault there at uh, Vegas. But, you know, the, the season is made up of a multitude of things and then you have to just, just have to look at Abu Dhabi for Carlos Sainz, for example. You know, the free practice crash, the, the poor qualifying, the ridiculous strategy that Ferrari put him on in the race as well. 
cost them a good few points there, so that could have made the difference as well. So it was a lot closer than I was expecting. I was expecting Mercedes to have a turbulent year this year, and yes, they did have a turbulent year, but only with one car. We'll come to them in a minute. So the fact that uh, Mercedes were able just to edge Ferrari at the end there, I was very close with this assumption, but I was just ever so slightly wrong there. The final couple of rounds going the way of Mercedes as opposed to Ferrari. And that was that, really. So, yeah, uh, Ferrari mounted a late charge, but it wasn't enough, and uh, Mercedes held on. So, yeah, I was wrong by a position here by putting Ferrari second. They ended up third in the championship overall, but it was bloody close, wasn't it? So, as mentioned, third place was, of course, Mercedes, Mercedes-Benz, Formula One, AMG, Patronus, Let's Stop Oil and all that bollocks, whatever they're called. I've no idea. Quite a long name, though, isn't it? Uh, so, I put them third. But of course they finished second and as mentioned it's exactly the same with Ferrari this year to be honest with them. Although Ferrari both their drivers were inconsistent to start with. Uh, you know making mistakes here and there, accident prone at times as well. For Mercedes this year George Russell just had a rough season overall didn't he? It? it was Hamilton doing the heavy work this year it must be said. Hamilton finishing in third spot in the driver standings. His teammate George Russell all the way down in eighth there. So had George Russell had a mo uh, had just a consistent season, has what Hamilton had, then they would have easily finished second in the standings. So, yeah, the Mercedes car looked better this year, but at the same time looked more difficult at times as well, didn't it? It was bizarre. Brazil, where they took a fabulous 1-2 finish at last year, this time around this year they were Pinot, where slipping down the order, struggling with tyre life, struggling with tyre degradation... It's a crazy one, isn't it? But overall, throughout the season, I think particularly with Hamilton, he's been much more stronger, much more uh, comfortable with the car as well, I would say. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one to put out there because George just struggled, ultimately, and uh, he never really found his feet. He was unlucky at times with the engine failure at Australia. Uh, there was a couple of strong performances here and there. Qatar was a good one after he c had contact with his teammate, of course. And uh, the the last race of the season at Abu Dhabi, it came good. But where was it for the rest of the year? It was pee bloody nowhere for most of it. And as can be seen in the points deficit there, third in the standings for Hamilton, eighth in the standings for George Russell. Not great, was it, by George? It must be said, he should have been well up there with his teammate, third or fourth in the standings. But yeah, a lonely season by George's standards, and that really did cost Mercedes. Like I say, in the end, it cost them nothing because they did secure that runner-up position. And even if George Russell was on fine form, there was no stopping that Red Bull. But it just made life more difficult when they didn't need it to be in those final few races when Ferrari were really gaining the momentum and they just held on. So yeah, I put Mercedes third. The finish second. I think had George had a couple more bad weekends, if we'd have not seen the impressive performances at Abu Dhabi, then they would have easily lost the, the, the second place to Ferrari. So, yeah, overall, third place, I predicted them. Second place, they finished. I am pleased for them, but that was all majority down to the points and the races that Lewis Hamilton had that meant that they were able to secure that P2 in the championship. In fourth place, I put... Alpine. I was very, very wrong with Alpine, wasn't I? They, uh, I predicted them to finish fourth, and here they are finishing in sixth place. So, yeah, you know, in the real life world, they didn't have a great season, did they? But here they are. I was predicting fourth, you know, and that would have been a great result from this year. But as it was, sixth was really the only place they really deserved to finish all season long. They, they got some good performances here and there. There were some impressive finishes, some impressive races by them. They shared a podium each for Ocon and Pierre Gasly. But for the most part, overall, it just didn't work out, did it? It didn't work out for them. They were very much just the team that were fighting for 8th, ninth, 10th, picking up a few points, but weren't really fighting with anyone at all. They were just that mid-grid... We're comfortably six, we're ahead of the cars behind us, but we're not as quick as the cars ahead of us. And that was where they stayed throughout the majority of the season. That P5, P6 area, and of course, when McLaren came charging up through the ranks, yep, P6 is where they stayed. Overall this season, it's been one of frustration to watch Alpine, not just because of the lack of pace and poor performance where you expected them to do more. I certainly expected them to do more anyway. Um, it was also a frustration of to why Ocon is their number one chosen child. It really didn't make sense. A lot of calls during the summer period, after the summer break, it must be said, 
You know, there were times where Pierre Gasly was miles faster, but no, he wasn't allowed to overtake Ocon. But then when Ocon had a go, he was allowed to overtake. And then you had all these battles and rivalries between the two of them that were unnecessary at times as well. And yeah, we do love good racing, of course we do. But uh, yeah, at times it got a little bit frustrating and it always seemed that the decision that was made, be it in the pit stops, be it on track, always favour Ocon over Gasly. And neither of those times it benefited the team overall. They were just trying to favour one driver. And at sometimes it cost the team points as well. As mentioned, it didn't matter anyway. Because they were sixth in the constructors. And they were safe in sixth. They weren't getting caught. They weren't going to overtake anyone. But it was just frustrating to see. So yeah... Alpine under-delivered in my estimations, it must be said, this season overall. A lot of things going on behind the scenes that were uncomfortable as well. S uh, sacking Lauren Rossi, there was other teams and personnel that left and quit and got sacked. and It just doesn't build a strong team, does it? It really doesn't. If, if you're moving and chopping and changing people around and not even giving those team members time to settle into their role as a new manager or a new whatever before sacking them again and getting someone else in, it doesn't... It doesn't breed progress, it just breeds nervousness as to who's next on the chopping block. And you need to be looking forwards, not behind you. And I think that was a case a lot of times for Alpine this year. So yeah, a messy season on track, a messy season off track, and overall just a poor season. So yeah, I predicted Alpine fourth, they finished sixth overall. I predicted in fifth place would be Aston Martin. Aston Martin, and did I get it spot on? Absolutely, I did. And everyone would have called me crazy at the start of the year. All the way up until the run of that summer break, everyone would have thought, you are absolutely mental. These are guys are on for the runners-up spot in the title. But what did I say in that video last year? I said that I predicted Aston Martin would be strong with Alonso, but leave a lot on the table because they've got Lance Stroll as his teammate. And that is absolutely spot on and absolutely correct. Pat yourself on the back, Joshua Stocks, because you've got something absolutely spot on. Not just, not just correctly predicting the finishing position of the team, but also correctly predicting what would happen and why they would finish so low down the order. Okay, there was that mid-spell, wasn't there, in the middle of that, after the summer break, you know, where we turned up to races where we weren't quite as strong as what we were at the start of the year. Spain was the first real chance that we saw of, of, of an off position, you know, finishing 7th and 8th as, as opposed to um, Alonso on the post. Podium. But most of the time, the points weren't coming because Lance Stroll was not delivering the goods. A car that was still good enough for Q3, even when it wasn't good enough for podiums in the hands of Alonso, was not good enough to get out of Q1 for Lance Stroll, and that cost the team dearly. Where would they have finished without this? Well, I think they'd have comfortably been fourth position easily had uh, Lance Stroll booked his ideas up and just picked up the points that were available and easily available as well at times you know we saw times where Alonso was getting on the podium finishing on the podiums and his teammate was outside the points you know so I think fourth place was easily achievable and they've lost that this year as a result of Stroll themselves just just Stroll on his own has cost that team one place in the constructors which nets themselves a lot of dollars it must be said I think had they gone, they went the wrong direction with the development and the setup and the upgrades of the cars as well. They got lost with it and then they reverted back to the old spec car and all of a sudden it was on pace again. I think had they just stuck to the guns of keeping the car they knew was reliable, I think they could have beat Ferrari as well, to be honest with you. So, yeah, I'm going to say that uh, overall, had the season gone perfectly well for Aston Martin with the car that they had... I think there would have been P3 finishers on the constructor standings this year. Uh, but as it was, Lance Stroll cost them a position and them going the wrong way in development and setup of the car cost them a position as well. There were a lost soul in that middle part of the uh, second phase of the season, weren't there? But found themselves and came good once again. So yeah, the main bulk of the points went missing as a result of Stroll's poor performances. But uh, yeah, they Aston Martin are to blame as well. So yeah, overall I predicted Aston Martin to finish fifth. And there they are, in fifth. In sixth place, I predicted McLaren. And they ended up, of course, finishing the season in fourth place. Now, this was all due to the upgrades, wasn't it? Who could have predicted that the upgrades would have been that good? They'd only picked up a handful of points in the early phases of the season. Uh, Australia, they'd managed to get some points as a result of that bullshit restart procedure where half the cars got wiped out. And Lando picked up a couple of points here and there, but for the most part, they were very much out of it and not looking like even point scorers regularly. But then the upgrades came at Austria for Lando Norris's car. And in 
netted them a podium. The updates came for Oscar Piastri's car and he was quickly and rapidly inside the points as well. And both drivers really did deliver the goods this season. It must be said, Oscar Piastri as a rookie had some fantastic performances. Yet there were a couple of races there where we were struggling with tyre life and overall pace against everyone else. But at circuits he's never been at before... It's understandable. He was a rookie at the end of the day and we have to allow mistakes to creep in there. You know, using his tyre life too much up at the start of the race, struggling in the later phases before his first round of stops. But at races like Qatar, he was impeccable, wasn't he? You know, so Oscar Piastri has proved that that second car, that second McLaren, can deliver because that second car has rarely delivered, hasn't it? In the hands of Daniel Ricciardo, it never did anything. In the hands of all the drivers previously... It never did anything, did it, that second seat. But uh, here we are, and Oscar Piastri has jumped into Formula 1, taken to it like a duck to water, and has delivered the goods. As had Lando Norris. You know, there was a couple of mistakes here and there by Lando this season that were a bit, nah, you know, you didn't need to do that, Lando. But for the most part, you know, he delivered all the results, didn't he? He really, really did. The driver pairing was phenomenal. Dare I say, and I'm going to be bold here, I think that in the next couple of years, that could be the strongest driver lineup in Formula One. You know, you're going to see the old stable uh, teams going to going to be unfolding, unraveling. You know, yeah, I mean, look at it. You, you're going to see, you know, Carlos and Leclerc at Ferrari. The consistent, but sometimes so inconsistent, it's unbelievable. You've got Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez. Well, Max Verstappen's carrying the whole team. George Russell and Lewis Hamilton this season. You'd think that'd have been one of the strongest lineups, but George didn't deliver. I think, give it another couple of years, and that, that McLaren team could be going places. I really do. Just with that level of upgrades. And then they brought some more upgrades again, and they just boosted themselves up again. Unbelievable. Really, really well. So, yeah, I based sixth place in the standings based on what I saw in, in winter testing. And, and I don't think that would have been a, an incorrect thing to say. I think um, McLaren would have naturally found pace and scored points, even if they'd have had the terrible car that they had at the start. Uh, to be able to beat the cars behind them, but I don't think they'd be beating anyone else ahead. So, in some respects, although I'm two positions out from where they actually finished, I don't think anyone could have predicted how good their upgrades would be and how good their understanding of the car would be in order to put it in the correct direction to get that car um, as high up at the grid as it was, to score as many podiums as it did. It was uh, pretty impressive to see. So, yeah, I, I predicted McLaren to finish sixth. In the end, they finished fourth. Uh, but uh, yeah, no one could have predicted that kind of level of progress from a team, a driver. It was just crazy. In seventh place, I predicted Alpha Tauri to finish there. And boy, oh boy, it was close at the end there, wasn't it? In the end, they finished eighth place in the constructor standings, three points behind the next team that finished ahead of them. And it was so, so close, wasn't it? I wasn't expecting it to be that hard for them, though. And I wasn't expecting them to finish eighth after such a dismal season but just a strong finish to the season. They were down in 10th in the standings for quite a number of races. I think we got to Texas, wasn't it? Was it Texas, the United States Grand Prix? And they were still last in the standings until after that race. Um, either way, it was absolutely mind-blowing how bad they were at the start of the year. Yuki Tsunoda carried that team through the year, it must be said, picking up the odd points here and there. He had three tenth place finishes, 14,000 eleventh place finishes like he always seems to do in Formula 1 of recent. But as the season got on, the upgrades came on the car, it got a little bit better, it got a little bit faster. We had the driver switches of course, Nick De Vries being binned off after just 10 races, replaced with Daniel Ricciardo who then broke his wrist in practice at Zanvor, had to draft Liam Lawson in, Liam Lawson had a, a few races and then they brought Daniel Ricciardo back in again when Daniel Ricciardo was better. I don't think that helped them in the constructors overall it must be said. Uh, was, was getting rid of Dick De Vries the right choice to be honest with you for the constructor standings on where they finished? Unfortunately, I would have to say yes. I don't think they'd have done any better than ninth. They maybe maybe would have got eighth by chance um, as, a re as a result of just picking up a few points here and there. I think De Vries would have been a point scorer eventually, but I don't think that they've been able to be a threat to P7 like they were with De Vries still in the car. I think the fact that Daniel Ricciardo came on board, um, despite the fact I don't personally rate him anymore I think he's a bit washed I do think he pushed uh, Sonoda's performance in the right direction 
and really encouraged Sonoda to get more out of himself and more out of the car. Of course, Liam Lawson picking up the couple of points at Singapore would have been a head turner for both Alpha Tauri and Yuki Sonoda. Uh, so, again, I think it got the best out of Sonoda, got the best out of the team. So, overall, switching the drivers wasn't the best thing in my mind. I think a rookie should always deserve a full season. Nick DeVries certainly deserved a full season. But in terms of where they finished this season for Alpha Tauri, I think making the driver switch was correct because it pushed the team and Sonoda into a more believable position that they could go forward. There was more pace in that car as opposed to just being reluctant and just like well we're at the back anyway what's the point you know so uh, yeah I would say overall this season it's been one of frustration to watch the Alpha Tauri team struggle but it was great to watch them come good towards the end some impressive drives and performances from each of their drivers minus Nick De Vries in some respects I'm afraid to say but he did really have the car at its worst Overall for me, Alpha Tauri, 8th place they finished, 7th place I predicted. I wasn't too far away in the end, but I was expecting it to be a lot more comfortable than it actually was. In 8th place, I predicted Haas to finish in 8th. Based on what they did last season, I thought we could see some strong performances at the start of the year and maybe slip, up, slip away at the end. But unfortunately for us, they finished 10th and last in the constructor standings this season. After being in 8th for quite a, a number of races, it must be said, um, the big points for them came with Nico Hulkenberg at the Austria Sprint Race, where he picked himself up three crucial points there. Uh, with, with a 6th place finish I think it was in the changeable weather conditions that Austria Sprint was a fantastic race it must be said um, overall you know this season has been one of two fortunes Kevin Magnussen I think could have got more out of the car in the early phases of the season I think Alkenberg as well when he was just settling himself back into a full time role didn't get the maximum out of the car when it was maybe there for a point or two but would it have affected their overall position? Well, they finished four points behind their nearest rival in ninth place. They would have had to get a point above it to uh, get the finish over, over them as well, due to the finishing positions in the constructors. So, in the end, five points behind them to make a difference. I don't think there was five points left on the table there, it must be said. I do think Kevin Magnussen could have picked up another couple. I do think uh, Nico Alkenberg could have picked up another couple as well. But I don't think it would have been anywhere near enough for them to finish anything higher than 10th this season, unfortunately. Tyre life was not their strong point. You know, they, they got the tyres up to temperature quickly, which meant they always often had a good start. They always had a strong qualifying performance. Nick Alkenberg this season has been the Q3 master at times in a car that isn't always capable of doing it. But of course, with warming up your tyres so quick comes the tyre deck too soon and they've been having to do two stops where other teams have been doing one stops the tyre life just drops away and if you leave them out there the sitting ducks the vulnerable Mexico was the perfect example for Nico Walkenberg trying his very best to hold on to that final points paying position and then with four laps to go he pretty much got overtaken by everyone because he was just sliding here there and everywhere at the end it was like he was in a drift racing championship as opposed to an actual Formula 1 car so very frustrating season by Haas as a Haas fan as well it was difficult to watch I didn't want to see him finish last in the constructors I like both drivers as well but yeah it's been a tale of two fortunes for uh, Haas this season it has, it has delivered some good moments and some strong qualifying performances here and there not just from Hulk but also from Kevin Magnussen the likes of Miami was a strong race for him but I think it was few and far between drivers didn't pick up a couple of points finishes where they should have been on offer but in the end, I don't, I don't think that, that even those points that they missed out on would have netted them anything better than 10th anyway, unfortunately. So yeah, Haas, I hope they do stronger next year. But for now, I predicted them 8th. They finished 10th. Finishing in 9th place, I predicted Alfa Romeo would finish in 9th. And 9th place, they did finish. So what could be said for them, really? Alfa Romeo have been the most frustrating team on the paddock this season. They really, really have. I mean, Haas have been frustrating at times. Don't get me wrong, their tie life has been abysmal and has really suffered and has made the team suffer. But I think that Alfa Romeo car could have done so much more this year but as it's been it's been another one of those seasons for Alfa Romeo where drivers aren't getting the maximum out of the, uh, out of the car you know if, if you're going to sum up Alfa Romeo season you're going to say Hungary aren't you that is the only way you're going to sum up Alfa Romeo season Zhou Guan Yu lining up P5 Valtteri Bottas P7 on the grid both into Q3 with some fantastic qualifying times and you think right Hungary is a difficult circuit to overtake a good clean start 
maintain position, maybe lose one or two places, that's fine, but they can stay in the points for the bulk of the race if something untoward, like a safety car, didn't intervene after they've had a pit stop or anything like that. But providing it's a good, clean race, they can they can easily finish inside the points. And what happens? What happens? Zhou Guan Yu goes and hits cars and loses his wing and whatever else. And Valtteri Bottas just t takes turn one like a granny and lets himself get overtaken by everyone and drops to P12. Frustrating, incredibly frustrating. It, that just summed up the season for me, to be honest with you. Valtteri Bottas is not getting the maximum amount of the car. Zhou Guan Yu has really proved he doesn't deserve yet another season in Formula 1 that he is getting. Valtteri Bottas' racecraft is just poor. He'll make a lazy look to the inside and then not bother. Oh, I'll have a, No, I'm not going to bother. And then when it comes to defending, it's... Oh, I'll defend. Oh, I'm not going to bother. I can have it. So, yeah, incredibly frustrating overall season for Alfa Romeo, it must be said. There's, there's nowhere for me to go with this other than the team's been poor, the drivers have been poor. I, I've not got a good word to say about anyone, to be honest, in that team, in that paddock. It's been frustrating, it's been poor, it's been very dismal, it must be said. So, yeah, for me personally, Alfa Romeo finished ninth in the Constructors. They want to consider themselves lucky that Haas were worse than them in terms of tyre life because... This team really deserved to finish last in the standings based on what we've seen this season. There wasn't any good ounce of, of greatness from anyone at any time. You know, 16 points, I think they could have easily trebled that score, to be honest with you. I think that car was capable of maybe 40 points plus. I really, really do. And, you know, you can tell me I'm wrong for that, but uh, I, I do think there was a lot more in that car than the drivers delivered and than what the team delivered as well. So yeah, Alfa Romeo, the most frustrating team on the in the paddock for me personally, the most frustrating team this season. And uh, yeah, I predicted the finish ninth, and they did finish ninth. They're lucky they weren't tenth. And then last but by no means least, you'll notice there's one team missing. I predicted Williams to finish tenth and last in the standings. And where did they end up? They ended up in P7. This is the one that I got really, really wrong. And I am glad I did. I really am glad I did. I got most of the teams like one position out. Something like that. You know, the Alpine and McLarens just switch around. And I got them right. But uh, for me personally, this is the team that has far and away exceeded my expectations. But not just that. A certain driver within that team has exceeded my expectations as well. Because although I knew Alex Albon was a strong driver... This year, he has carried that Williams squad to that seventh place, single-handedly, all barring a point, it must be said. Let's be honest, there was one point scored by Logan Sargent following the disqualification of two drivers at uh, the United States Grand Prix. So otherwise, he wouldn't have scored any. But uh, for me personally, yeah. You know, Alex Albon this season has been fantastic. He has been a great asset to Williams. If you'd have had another Logan Sargent, if it had been Logan Sargent and Nicholas Latifi, what would they have scored? Maybe five points, six points, something like that between them. Nicholas Latifi has been known to score the odd one or two, hasn't he? But, uh, yeah, Alex Albon this season has been great. He really, really has. It must be said, well-deserving of what he has achieved in that car this season. And even then, there was mistakes from him as well. Let's not forget that, of course. A sixth-place finish went missing at Australia because he dipped his car off of the rumble strip at, uh, at the end of the first sector and he smashed it into the wall, uh, causing a red flag. That was a frustrating moment and could have made that P7 finish all the more comfortable when Alpha Tauri were coming to catch him up. Um... But yeah, you know, overall, it's just been one of those seasons for Alex Albon where, OK, there has been mistakes here and there. If next year he irons those mistakes out and he is just as consistent as he has been for most of the season, we're going to see a driver that is going to be delivering the goods and delivering the points every single race, I feel. I think Williams have taken that next step up now. They've got that prize money to be able to take the next step up to the next level. Ne not necessarily going into 2024, of course, because they'll have been using 2023's money to spend in 2024. But for the next couple of years, it gives them that bit of security with that extra prize money that, look, we can invest in this team now and we can see that there's results coming. James Vowles, I think, has been a great asset to that team as well. Even when the team necessarily hasn't had the pace... I think his experience has come in at times as well to maybe influence decisions and, and say to people, look, you could do with pitting him here, you know. I'm not saying he's an expert and a guru sat on that pit wall and I know people know their jobs incredibly well, but I think just having the presence of someone like James Fowles within that team who has been a fantastic character and a, a real team player and a real team builder as well. You know, the, the words that he has, has offered to the team, to the drivers, even to Logan Sargent as well at times, you know, I think it really shows 
a good character and a strong leader within a team when he's able to do that. And I think he has been a great asset to the Williams squad as well and has really driven that team forwards to want to get the results and to think, well, yeah, we can be proud of a P8 finish instead of just going, oh, P8, well, we're not on the podium like we used to be back in the glory days. You know, I think he's got that mindset out of them now and he really wants to say, look, guys, it's only P8, but next time it'll be P7, then it'll be P6. We can do this, you know. And I think he's really building the steps and the foundations now to get Williams back up towards the front. I'm not ever going to say they're going to be a front-running team by any stretch of the imagination. But if they can build on the progress that they've had this year from last, there's no reason why they can't finish sixth next year in the Constructors. But... Will Logan Sargent affect that? Like Lance Stroll has affected uh, Aston Martin from finishing anything better than fifth this season, could Logan Sargent be the stopping block this year? Alex Albon was able to carry that team to P7 in the Constructors this year, but I think next year he's going to need Logan Sargent to be there scoring the points. Williams are going to need him to start scoring the points as well. You know, one lucky point due to disqualification isn't good enough. That car was good enough for points on numerous occasions this year. Now, let's not let's not be about, about the bush. You know, the, the three worst cars this season were clearly the Alfa Tauri, the Haas and the Alfa Romeo. So they finished ahead of those, but it should have been much more comfortable than what it was. And at times where Alex Albon was getting fantastic P7 finishers, where was Logan Sargent? Down at the back, out in Q1, lining up 20th, getting lap times deleted in qualifying. You know, Alex Albon hasn't been a saint when it comes to track limits either, of course. I'm not saying he has been, but overall, you look at the season, you go, well, Alex did that, you know. Logan Sargent offered nothing, and the fact he's been re-signed for next year means he's got nothing and nowhere to hide now. He's got he's got nothing, no more excuses left. He's got nowhere to hide. He has to deliver from race one and consistently deliver the goods as well. It re he really, really has because you know the investment that's going back into Alpha Tauri from Red Bull and the B team side of things are going to go back up. So I can see Alpha Tauri making steps forward. If Haas get their tyre life together, that car's not actually a bad car, so they could progress forward as well. You know, the Williams are going to have a lot of threat this year, and and going into next year, they're going to they're going to have the threat from teams that are going to get sudden backing from Red Bull. They, they potentially can work out what's wrong. Alfa Romeo, you never know. Joe Guan Yu and Valtteri Bottas might really surprise us. I think that car was good enough for seventh in the constructors anyway this year. It's just that they didn't deliver the goods. So Williams need to rely on Logan Sargent and they need to put faith in that signing and that it was a wise choice because I still don't think it is. I think Logan, admittedly, a difficult first rookie season but sometimes you don't deserve a second chance and I didn't really see anything from Logan this season that proved to me that he deserved that second chance. I've got to be honest. But nonetheless this season... It's been a fantastic season overall for Williams, mainly for the fact of the addition of James Vowles, mainly for the fact of Alex Albon's incredible performances at times. And had he not been unlucky at times, Alex, or making mistakes like he has done, there could have been more points on offer there. So, realistically, I think Logan Sargent maybe should have scored about 15, 20 points this season. I would say that as a rookie would be a fair score because that car did have pace. I think Alex Albon missed out on another potential 15 to add to that tally as well. The likes of Singapore, where he got took out by Sergio Perez, the Australia incident of course as well and then other positions where he'd been clinging on to that P10 position but then fading away, Belgium as well of course where the tyre strategy was just all wrong and he was running round in 8th and didn't pick up any points at all so yeah there's a lot more to come from Williams and I think we've not seen the full potential of Williams this season but Logan Sargent is the main cork in the bottle for them progressing forward even if they have a really good car next year I don't think Alex can do it all on his own. So anyway then guys, those were my predictions at the start of the year and how we did in the end. So yeah, I got Red Bull correct, I got uh, Alfa Romeo correct and I got Aston Martin correct. So I only got three right this time, but I feel overall it was more consistent. The only one I really got really, really wrong was uh, Williams from 10th up to 7th, my prediction. Everyone else was within one or two, so uh, I'm allowing myself those. So maybe in some respects not as good as last year, my predictions, but in others, a lot better. So as always, thank you so, so much for watching, guys. I'll see you all again very, very soon. And as always, much love.